Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon. We're happy to have you all join us this afternoon as we do a deep dive into Duchenne and the Bones. We've got two wonderful guest speakers with us today, Dr. Leanne Ward, who is an endocrinologist and professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa, along with Adam Wexler, who's a member of our PPMD Adult Advisory Committee. You may recognize them for, from PPMD's uh, virtual conference this past summer. We heard you loud and clear, Duchenne community. You had lots of questions about Duchenne and bone health. So we're happy to take a deeper dive today back into that topic and learn a little bit more and continue to answer some of your questions. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Ward and Adam to start uh, their presentation and share some information with us. At the conclusion of their presentation, we'll go ahead and open it up for your questions. And we look forward to uh, answering as many as we possibly can. Dr. Ward. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, and it's really a pleasure to partner with PPMD on this important topic, and I'm delighted to be able to do that today. I'm going to start by introducing my co-chair for this session. Adam Wexler is a 24-year-old living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. He is located with his family in Vermont. He's currently serving in AmeriCorps as a work readiness trainer for people with disabilities. Adam graduated from the University of Vermont in 2018 with a degree in environmental studies. And here he developed a passion for sustainability and accessibility in the built environment. And in his free time, he enjoys reading, playing video games and spending time with his friends. So real pleasure to be working with Adam once again. Adam? Yeah, yeah great working with you again, Leanne. Um, and so I'm just gonna give uh, Leanne, a quick introduction as well. Uh, so Dr. Leanne Ward is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa, uh, where she has held a research chair in pediatric bone health since 2010. Recently, Leanne was the chair of the Endocrine and Bone Health Subcommittee for the Centers for Disease Control 2018 DMD Clinical Care Considerations. She has also partnered with PPMD to educate the DMD community about bone health and endocrine issues for the last few years. Thank you very much, Adam. So what we'd like to accomplish with you today is, first of all, you're going to hear Adam's journey with fractures due to osteoporosis, and it's quite a story indeed. So Adam will kick off this webinar by walking you through his experience, and then I'll have an opportunity to ask him some questions about his experience so that you can hear his view. And then I will talk about the causes, the diagnosis, and the current standard of care for the treatment of fractures due to osteoporosis. And then Adam will have an opportunity to ask me some questions. And then we will proceed after that to hear your questions that you submit via the link or via the chat line as so that we can understand what's on your minds and take time to address your questions. So we're going to start then with Adam walking you through his journey with fractures due to osteoporosis. Adam. All right. Yeah. Um, so uh, based on my timeline here, I was first diagnosed uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, when I was three years old. Uh, at the time, my parents noticed um, I had difficulty keeping up with other kids and I'd fall frequently. And so along with the following, I had my first fracture um, at three years old, um, just after my diagnosis, I believe. Um, and what happened there, I essentially fell off a short climbing structure, it really wasn't very far off the ground, only uh, two or three feet. And then, so I had my second fracture uh, about a year later when I was around four, um, and again, uh, with this fracture, I fell off a short climbing structure. Um, and so this was interesting um, because these fractures uh, happened before I even started taking steroids. And um, these, these fractures, basically, it didn't, didn't take a lot um, to cause them. And so then I started taking uh, steroids to Flazacort uh, when I was six years old. And then in the following few years, um, from when I was eight to about 14 years old, um, I had a number um, of other fractures, uh, including 
a big toe fracture, apparently when I was eight, um, a wrist fracture, uh, again, which was um, from falling. I imagine I was playing with friends and uh, I tripped and um, basically stuck my hand out to catch my fall. And that was enough um, to lead to a wrist fracture. And then uh, when I was around 14, I had a, an ankle fracture and then also a finger fracture. Um, yeah. And so uh, my first major fracture was then when I was 16 years old um, and I broke my left femur. Um, so what happened there was I was still pretty new um, to using a wheelchair. Um, and so I, I wasn't really used to wearing a seatbelt, uh, the seatbelt on my chair yet. Um, so I was pretty used to just driving my chair around in school. Um, uh, but this fracture, this time I was at a local park um, at a Boy Scout picnic. Um, and so I tried driving my wheelchair over a swale, um, which is like a, a ditch essentially. Uh, turned out to be steeper than I thought it was. Uh, and the chair stopped, but I fell out. And um, I was then taken to the hospital uh, and had a full leg cast. And uh, that was about the time when I stopped walking as well. Um, yeah, I didn't, I was still walking at, at that point. Uh, but after the femur fracture, I was really um, more, more chair dependent. And then uh, the next year, um, when I was 17, uh, my scoliosis got worse. And I was at a point where I had, I had a 40 degree 40 degree curve in my spine. And so we decided it was time uh, for spinal fusion surgery. And so in preparation for that surgery, um, just knowing that my bones were already weaker because of uh, taking steroids, um, I took two doses of what's called pomidronate, um, which is a type of uh, drug called bisphosphonate, um, which was intended to help strengthen uh, my bones some uh, uh, just before the surgery. And then, uh, yeah, so those those doses of permidronate are about four to six weeks apart. And I started stopped taking them two months before the surgery. And so then for the next three years, uh, I was doing pretty well, didn't have uh, any more fractures uh, until I was about 20. And I ended up breaking both of my femurs this time. And um, so what happened here uh, was again, a situation where uh, this time I was wearing my seatbelt, um, but the chair tipped and kind of landed on me. And so I, I was over at, at a friend's house. I was in college at the time. And um, for most of that semester, i had been using a portable ramp that we had um, that I'd leave at my friend's house. And uh, it turn, turns out this, this ramp, there was no problems throughout most of the semester, but the ramp ended up being too short for the number of stairs, which made it too steep. Um, and so as I was trying to drive down, down this ramp for whatever reason this time, like I didn't have my chair tilted back enough or, or something like that, uh, wheelchair tipped and, and fell on me. Um, fortunately, my dad was pick, it was there to pick me up for the end of the semester and uh, just made sure I could still feel my fingers and toes and then had some of my friends help him uh, sit, sit me in my chair back up. Um, and then I drove my chair into the car. And fortunately, we were only about a minute from the hospital. Uh, and at that point, um, that's basically the last thing I remember from, uh, from that night. Um, cause I ended up developing, uh, what's called fat embolism syndrome, um, which Leanne will go into more detail about. Um, but basically from breaking the facts, the breaking long bones, um, 
basically fat that was inside of my bones uh, leaked um, into my bloodstream. And this caused me to go into respiratory, respiratory distress and I quickly um, deteriorated. And so at that point, um, I was then intubated and spent five days in the ICU um, unconscious the whole time. So this was definitely a very scary time uh, for my family and later for, for me as well. And then uh, two years later, um, when I was 22, I started going to a new clinic in Massachusetts. Um, and at this point, uh, the clinic, um, we did more back x-rays and started to identify uh, vertebral compression fractures in my spine. Um, and so I, I started on zoletronic acid, um, which again is a bisphosphonate. Um, because of uh, these compression fractures. Um, and then I do these the zoledronic acid infusions about once a year. Great, well, thank you, Adam, for taking through that story, that journey of yours, which is really quite compelling with a number of fractures and even complications of fractures, including the fat embolism syndrome. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about your journey. First of all, what would you say was the most challenging part of this journey for you? Yeah. Um, so looking back, uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me was uh, kind of about fall prevention and looking back, like I have to realize to be careful um, while driving in my wheelchair, um, especially on the une uneven surfaces. Um, uh, but it was difficult at the time to be aware um, at all times because uh, a kid, as a kid, like you don't want to have to worry about um, too many things, but um, it's not, not necessarily what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind. Yeah, as a child, you, you just want to get out and play, don't you? You don't have to be, to be thinking about fall prevention, but certainly your story, uh, having fallen out of, you know, with the wheelchair is one thing to think about, isn't it? So that's a great point to raise with the viewership. Can you tell me a little bit about how you felt when you received the pomidronate and the zoledronic acid? Did you have any of the side effects that uh, individuals can experience with the first dose? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I remember after the initial pyrimidronate doses I did when I was uh, 17, um, like I think I remember I did feel kind of feverish afterwards, um, as well as with the zoledronic acid. Um, after my first dose, and it was like some digestive issues for about a day, my like, stomach upset, um, and interestingly, um, I just had my third zoledronic acid infusion um, in August, and in that time, I actually uh, felt more side effects. Um, mm. Like I noticed some muscle pain afterwards, and ended up having to lay down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, I think an important point as well. Usually, the side effects, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute are just with the first dose. However, in your experience, and also in my experience as a physician, sometimes in boys and men with Duchenne, we do see the side effects with subsequent doses, although not usually to the same extent as with the first dose. I wanted to understand a little bit more about your vertebral compression fractures, Adam. Did you have any pain that prompted an x-ray or was that just something that was done as part of routine bone monitoring in your case? Yeah, um, this was not um, because of a complaint. Like, um, occasionally I might notice some back pain, but like it doesn't last very long. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this case, it was really more of just like a routine checkup on for my bone health and mm -hmm. see how things were going. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a, a really important point as well. We know that vertebral compression fractures, and I'm going to show examples in a minute, can be asymptomatic. They can be completely without pain, and yet they're a very clear sign of osteoporosis and the need for treatment. So we do recommend, just as your clinician did, doing routine x-rays periodically to pick up on those vertebral fractures, just as was done in your case. Adam, if you had one message from your journey that you wanted to share with the viewership, what would that be today? Mm -hmm. um, so as I was kind of talking about earlier, I think um, kind of my overall message would be uh, to be careful driving around in your wheelchair, uh, especially over rough terrain, because um, I found it's not always as stable as you might think. Um, so I think it's just uh, important to be aware of your surroundings um, and really do your best to avoid falling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Great, great advice, Adam. So with that in mind, what you've heard from Adam, which is a quite a journey, I'm going to now build on what Adam has said and provide you with a little bit more in the way of sort of background to the topic in general. And I'm going to be highlighting as I go through my little section here, some of the points that Adam has drawn out in his journey. So the first thing that I would like to share with you is that we know that the muscle weakness of Duchenne is a key driver of the long bone and other fractures. And by long bone, I mean the femur, for example, the tibia and the leg, the humerus. Adam had a fracture of the humerus at a young age and the forearm, the radius and the ulna. We know that steroids can then exacerbate the tendency to fracture, but certainly the muscle weakness is playing a role for these kinds of fractures, long bone and other non-vertebral fractures. Steroids are the agents that bring about a predisposition to vertebral fractures, the fractures in the spine. And you can see them here in this montage, and I'm going to show you some in vivo examples as well. So steroids are the main driver behind vertebral fractures, but the muscle weakness can also potentiate the likelihood of a vertebral fracture. And we know that because we've seen patients who have had vertebral fractures in the absence of steroids. It doesn't happen very often, but it certainly happens. So we have both the muscle weakness and the steroids as the main driver of fractures, muscle weakness mostly driving the long bone, but potentiated by steroids and the steroids largely affecting the spine. Now, these are some examples. So I want to just draw your attention to the slide on the left. There's a lot of information on this x-ray and I teach my students and, and other physicians that as endocrinologists, although we're really trained in looking at blood work and growth and puberty, we also really need to be looking at our x-rays because there's so much information on x-rays. Even without having a bone density at our disposal, we can tell a lot from x-rays. So here on the left, this is a boy 13 years of age with Duchenne, and on the right is a boy the same age without Duchenne. And there's a lot that I can see here. So first of all, I see that the bone looks paler. So that tells me that the bone density is likely to be low when I do a bone density test. The other thing that I see is that there's a little crack here in the cortex, that's the big arrow. So that's a fracture. And we know that the end of the long bone, and this is the femur, is a site of frequent fracture in this setting because the ends of the long bones get thinner as they approach the growth plates. And the other thing that I see is that the bone is not as wide in the boy with Duchenne compared to the uh, image on the right. And that independently of bone density is another reason why the bones break. So not only are the bones low in density, but they're smaller. And we know that smaller bones are not as strong as bigger bones. So there's a, a number of factors here going on that predispose to fractures. And then on the right, we have a montage of the same patient at three different time points looking at the spine x-ray. And so we do strongly encourage periodic spine x-rays because as Adam said, 
he didn't have back pain or at least nothing significant and yet you can have signs of osteoporosis in the spine so let's look at this so on the far left you have a normal spine x-ray and this boy is at about eight years of age and he's on steroids he comes back to see me a couple of years uh, later and he has a single vertebral fracture that is asymptomatic he's not complaining of any back pain and yet that is a clear sign of osteoporosis so that vertebral body with the arrow is not as square and big as the adjacent vertebral bodies and you may say well boy that's pretty subtle or you may say well that looks pretty trivial compared to say the femur fracture but in fact the vertebral body should be able to maintain their square like shape and their normal height and when they don't when they collapse just under the weight of the patient we see that as a very clear and uh, definite sign of osteoporosis if we do nothing, then those vertebral fractures will progress. So the uh, one with the arrow on top is has progressed compared to the one that was done a couple of years earlier. And then there's a new vertebral fracture below and even above the vertebral body is starting to lose some height. And this is called the vertebral fracture cascade where vertebral fractures at time point A are associated with an increased likelihood of new vertebral fractures at a subsequent time point. So the take home messages here are that spine x-rays are really important just as Adam uh, had and taught us about and that it's important we do these even if there isn't the presence of back pain. Now here's another example of an important message that I want to share with you and this is a um, montage of a boy who was on steroids, GC means glucocorticoids or steroids. And he had a fracture of the tibia at six years of age. Now, I don't have an x-ray to show you because I didn't see him at that time. He had fracture management and then he went home. The tibia is the part of the leg below the knee. And then he stayed on his steroids and came back seven years later at 13 years of age. And he had multiple vertebral compression fractures. So again, these should be square, but they're more triangular or even codfished, as we say, or flattened like rectangles. And so what we understand now is that this boy's first osteoporotic fracture was at six years of age. It wasn't at 13 when he came back with back pain. It was seven years earlier. And I would suggest to you that in Adam's case, where he had a fracture of the humerus at a young age, following just a trivial fall was also evidence of osteoporosis. And the fact that Adam went on to have more fractures is in keeping with that. Children at a young age often fracture the forearm, the radius and the ulna. And it is sometimes difficult to say whether that's an osteoporotic fracture, but humerus fractures, the ones above the elbow like Adam had, are far more uncommon in childhood, so a humerus fracture should certainly draw attention. But even a forearm fracture, a radius fracture, in a patient with a muscle issue and a patient on steroids is potentially an osteoporotic event. So this is a message that we're trying to teach the Duchenne community and also to teach our colleagues who are caring for boys and men with Duchenne. Now, Adam gave this very dramatic story of having had uh, bilateral femur fractures, so two femur fractures, and then very shortly after developing respiratory distress. In fact, Adam doesn't even remember that part of his story. He remembers the fractures and then that was about it. And I think that speaks to how, how unwell Adam was. I'm so pleased that Adam got attention immediately. That is so important in this setting. And so let me tell you about fat embolism syndrome. This is a rare complication of a bone fracture or a bone injury. You do not have to have a broken, broken bone to have fat embolism syndrome. And it's something that can happen to anyone after they've had a major injury to the femur, which is the largest bone in the body. So how does this work? We know that in anyone who has subnormal mobility or anyone on steroids, even outside of the Duchenne setting, that there is an accumulation of fat cells within the bone marrow, which is inside the bone. Those fat cells are called adipocytes. And then when there is a bone injury or a fracture, but again, doesn't necessarily have to be a broken bone, just a bone bruise, so even after a fall without a fracture, those fat cells or adipocytes, they 
enter into the bloodstream and they coalesce to form fat globules which get into the lung, shower the lung, and cause respiratory distress. So again, a rare complication, but one that's important to know about. And so if you had a patient or someone that you knew that had a femur fracture or a fall and then some discomfort to suggest they had a bone bruise, and then within 24 hours or 48 hours, they developed respiratory distress, difficulty breathing, the first thing to think about is fat embolism syndrome. And that's particularly important in this COVID era where not all respiratory problems are COVID related. So difficulty breathing after a fall, difficulty breathing after a fracture is a reason to seek medical attention immediately. Now people often ask me about how to use bone density testing in this setting. And I just wanna tell you about bone densities. So first of all, bone density is just one part of the bone health evaluation. When I meet a family and a boy with Duchenne, the first thing that I wanna know as a clinician is how the boy or the man is doing from a uh, overall mobility and pain perspective. So I wanna understand function and I wanna understand if there's any back pain and I wanna understand the fracture history in detail, just like Adam enumerated for you. And it's only after I've understood all of that that I acquire a bone density test and look at the bone density. So spine x-rays, if you had to choose between a spine x-ray and a bone density test, you would prioritize the spine x-ray and understanding the fracture history is critical for uh, the bone health assessment. But here's our bone density test by DEXA. And what's important to understand here is that bone density should uh, evolve similar to a growth curve. So you expect bone density to, on this particular test, to change with age. And so we follow the bone density just like we follow growth on a growth curve. So here you see bone density curves. And understand that a single assessment doesn't give us all that much information. What we're really interested in is assessments over time. We're also interested in assessments at different skeletal sites if that's available to your clinician and it isn't always. We know that the bone density at the hip is very sensitive and so it can fall before we see it at fall at other skeletal sites. So this is an example of an 11 year old boy with Duchenne on steroids and his hip BMD is going down. The total body BMD in the middle is plateauing but not going down at the same rate. And then the spine BMD is going down as well but not at the same rate as the hip. So in my clinic, I use different skeletal sites to get a sense of how uh, the boy is doing and I'm looking for changes over time. Important to understand that this test is two-dimensional, whereas bones are three-dimensional. And so the bone density results are lower in patients who are petite. And this is something that your clinician will take into account when he or she interprets the bone density test as well. So how do we optimize skeletal strength in this setting? So your clinician with whom you're collaborating on your bone health care will have a look at your nutrition and address nutritional deficiencies. So vitamin D deficiency is just very common in the general population. In Canada, we're considered a Nordic country, so I see a low levels often and vitamin D supplementation is frequently required, if not universally required on a daily basis. Some patients also have calcium deficiency, but that's less common. We do encourage calcium through the diet, through dairy products for patients who are unable to take in dairy, then a calcium supplement might be required. We do encourage clinicians to talk to their patients about puberty. Puberty is often delayed because of the steroids in this setting. And we do encourage that conversation by at least 14 years of age, usually starting around 12 years of age. And there's another webinar that will talk about that in more detail. We do encourage clinicians to address with you over and underweight. So both being underweight and overweight can be deleterious to bone strength. We certainly spend a lot of time talking about fall prevention. And I think this is sometimes missed in osteoporosis clinics this notion that we really have to talk about fall prevention. We certainly don't want uh, patients to feel that they can't go out and play. So certainly keeping moving is important. 
important as far as possible, but avoiding falls that could otherwise be prevented, I think is really important. So in Canada, we have these long, you know, very challenging winters. And I talk to my patients and my parents about fall prevention on the ice. I encourage them to buy those yak tracks that go under the shoes or the boots to allow you to have traction on ice. I really can't emphasize enough the importance of talking about fall prevention, including as Adam pointed out, um, in the wheelchair, perhaps uh, your, your family member or yourself, you're getting used to your wheelchair and maybe there's some uncertainty there. And I think just discussing how to maneuver the wheelchair and take precaution is important. Now, growth hormone for optimization of height or bone health is not considered routine in this setting uh, because there is insufficient safety and benefit data. Uh, so we don't recommend this as just part of routine standard of care. If you are considering growth hormone or you're on growth hormone, it would be in a highly specialized center, uh, perhaps under a research protocol to really understand that delicate base, uh, balance between safety and benefit. So how do we then monitor and treat? So these are guidelines, as Adam alluded to in the introduction, that were put together in consultation with myself and a group of international clinicians invested in this topic and we published those in 2018. So I would strongly encourage your clinicians to read these guidelines which really map out the uh, minimum standard of care for bone health in this setting. So we recommend that boys and men with Duchenne have bone density testing yearly starting ideally around the time of diagnosis or nor later starting at the time of steroid initiation. If you're on steroids, then we suggest a spine x-ray every one to two years, no more than every two years. If you're not on steroids, you can still have vertebral fractures, so we suggest a spine x-ray every two to three years. And those spine x-rays should be done even more often if the bone density drops by more than a half a standard deviation or if there's back pain. If bone density testing is not available, then you just do the spine x-rays because in fact it's the spine x-rays that are really going to trigger uh, treatment. And then we treat at early signs of osteoporosis. We don't wait for uh, significant back pain going on for some time. We treat early signs even if there's verbal fractures without back pain, this is an indication to start therapy. And certainly a single non-vertebral fracture or long bone fracture would also be an indication for therapy. And then we recommend intravenous bisphosphonate therapy, which I'll talk about in more detail, and continuing that therapy as bone protection for as long as the individual is on steroids, and maybe even longer if there are ongoing bone health issues that need to be tackled. Adam thought it would be interesting for me to just explain a little bit about how bisphosphonate therapy works. So it targets the osteoclast, which is like a little Pac-Man cell, which chews up bone or resorbs bone. In osteoporosis, at least in the early phases, this osteoclast is overactive, so it's chewing up more bone than it should. The bisphosphonates that I'm going to talk about, they basically stun the osteoclast they put it to sleep. We still see it under the microscope. It's just not working. It loses its little ruffled border, which is what chews up bone, so that you get a net uh, increase in terms of bone balance, favoring bone formation. Now, Adam talked both about pimidronate and zoledronic acid, and both are excellent agents. And it isn't that one is superior to the other, it's that one is a little bit more convenient than the other. So in your center, if your clinician has access to pimidronate, that's perfectly fine. If your clinician has access to zoledronic acid, you might wanna go that route. Let me explain a little bit about the difference. So pimidronate intravenous is given over four hours. It's a little gentler in terms of the first infusion side effects, and it's given every four months. Zoledronic acid is a one hour infusion, so it's more convenient. It tends to have a little bit more in the way of particularly gastrointestinal side effects like nausea and vomiting with the first infusion, and it's given every six months. 
we're going to talk about side effects a little bit more in detail, but you can see that zoledronic acid is a shorter infusion time and it lasts longer. So my patients are on zoledronic acid uh, because it's more convenient. And the goals of treatment are to improve back pain if it exists, to stabilize any vertebral fractures that are there on x-ray, so to prevent them from collapsing further, to prevent new vertebral fractures, to uh, re reduce the risk of new long bone fractures, and to try to mitigate or minimize those declines in bone density. Now here's a little bit more about the side effects and um, Adam has already alluded to this, but the classic side effects with the first dose would be fever, nausea, vomiting, bone pain, including at sites that are already involved like the vertebral bodies if they're fractured, uh, muscle pain, and low calcium, which is usually just something we see in the blood that doesn't cause any problems. And we treat these first infusion side effects with antipyretics, with anti-nausea medications. If a, a boy or a man feels particularly unwell, we um, have a very low threshold for giving extra steroid to prevent adrenal insufficiency. And we give calcium supplementation for five to 10 days after the infusion. And we give vitamin D supplementation before the infusion to really optimize intestinal calcium absorption. Now, Adam talked about the fact that he still was having side effects after, after two or three doses. And I must say that I have seen that. And I've seen that in my population of patients where I've treated literally thousands of children with different conditions over 25 years. I have seen that occur from time to time, most frequently in the Duchenne population for reasons that are not clear. Generally speaking, in my experience, the first dose uh, provides uh, the, the greatest side effect um, uh, profile, and then with subsequent doses, the side effects aren't quite uh, the same. And so Adam has had that experience where he's con continuing not to feel quite himself on subsequent treatments. Uh, so bisphosphonates are given every four to six months during growth. Once finished growing, if the steroids are continuing, we would recommend continuing bone protection uh, once yearly. And even if steroids are discontinued after growth is finished, there may be a need to continue bone protection even longer. So consider this bone protection uh, to um, encourage and foster bone strength as far as possible in this setting. These are just some examples of, of what I uh, would anticipate in the absence of bone protection uh, over years of steroids. You can see that the vertebral bodies should be square and tall and they're flattened. So that's without bone protection. This is with bone protection. You can see that the vertebral bodies are much denser. Uh, you can see that white rim, which uh, indicates an improvement in bone density that's even visible on the x-ray. Uh, we do see with poor growth because of steroids and bone protection that sometimes there is nevertheless a little bit of progression in the vertebral uh, collapse, usually in the lower part of the spine, and I suspect that may be related to the lower doses of this condition. And then if a patient is growing well with bone protection, then we would expect those vertebral bodies to reshape now we don't see that reshaping of prior fractures unless there is normal growth. And typically we don't see normal growth unless somebody comes off their steroids, which isn't something that we encourage. So we uh, encourage bone protection. We accept that growth may um, not be optimal. And so we accept that we're really trying to stabilize the spine and pre prevent that uh, dramatic collapse that you see on the left. And so here is the uh, algorithm for this approach. Just to summarize once again, and as published in Lancet Neurology 2018, we have this monitoring phase that starts around the time of steroid initiation or around the time of diagnosis uh, with annual spine X, uh, one to two year spine X-rays and annual bone density tests. We start treatment early, first signs of vertebral changes or a single fracture. And then we continue bisphosphonate therapy for as long as the patient is on steroids and maybe even longer. And in another webinar, it will be discussed about testosterone for pubertal induction. 
And the last thing that I just want to say before I turn it back over to Adam is that we need to be mindful of the fact that intravenous bisphosphonate therapy increases BMD. That's what it does. And there are parts of the skeleton that are more sensitive to increases in BMD than others. And there are parts of the skeleton that would benefit from a drug that increases bone shape to make it bigger, but bisphosphonates don't do that. So let me explain. So at the spine and also at the hip, the bone is quite porous. It's actually called spongy bone. And so there are holes in the bone that are very sensitive to drugs that increase bone density like intravenous bisphosphonates. So we see that the spine and the hip are fairly sensitive to intravenous bisphosphonate therapy. With uh, long bones, the bone is more compact. It's actually called compact bone. And there aren't as many holes and they're not as big. So long bones are not as bone density modifiable as the spine and the hip. And so we do continue to see uh, from time to time long bone fractures despite intravenous bisphosphonate therapy. So when I start a patient on bisphosphonate therapy, I say we are really targeting the spine, trying to keep the spine as tall and strong as possible. We're also targeting the hip. We also expect that the long bone fracture rate will be reduced, but we may still see fractures of the long bones. And then intravenous bisphosphonate therapy does not make bones bigger. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the femurs fracture, for example, because they are smaller. So that's not something that we can expect to accomplish with a bisphosphonate. And we have ideas about ways that we could make bones uh, bigger with some um, potentially drugs that we would like to explore in research studies, but we're a ways away from that at the moment. So that is my background information for you. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, both Adam's story with you and then that background. And, and we look forward to your questions. I'm just gonna put it over to Adam to see if Adam has any questions for me with that background information in mind. So I guess uh, just to not take it too much time, um, I think I'll ask only one or two questions. Um, so I guess um, sort of like how I ended my um, discussion of my, uh, I guess, history with, with fractures. Um, basically, what, what is the best piece of advice you have um, regarding bone health for those with Duchenne and their parents? Mm -hmm. So I think the, the main messages I'd like the viewership to understand is that bone health needs to be taken care of very early on in your journey. And I would strongly advise you to link with a clinician who understands bone health monitoring, who understands the importance of spine x-rays, which start early around the time of steroid initiation or around the time of diagnosis and then periodically. And so that you can partner with someone in that monitoring, which starts so very early. So that's my first message. And the second message is just to reiterate the importance of fall prevention uh, as, a, as a mechanism to prevent particularly long bone fractures. Do you have any other questions for me, Adam? Um, let's see. And I guess one, one more short one. Um, do the uh, recommendations for, for bone health differ at all um, versus when you're uh, still walking versus when you enter a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the bone, the bone health uh, recommendations are the same, Adam, whether you are ambulatory or non-ambulatory. So early, treat, early identification of fractures, uh, particularly those asymptomatic fractures of the spine with periodic spine x-rays every one to two years on steroids or every two to three years off steroids and then intervening at those first signs and not waiting for multiple signs. And so that is true whether you are ambulatory or non-ambulatory. That's a great question. Do you wanna ask me one more? Um, let's see. Oh, I guess uh, one, one more that came up uh, during the talk. Um, you mentioned how being over or underweight uh, can contribute to bone weakness. Uh, how, in what, like, 
how does it contribute to bone weakness? Mm -hmm. So underweight is a concern just because of the nutritional issues that go along with being underweight. So being underweight is just a marker of overall caloric and nutritional status. And so the bones require a lot of nutrients in order to be strong. So you want a healthy weight that basically is a barometer of your overall nutritional status. And then being overweight, the concern there is that if you're overweight and you fall, then your skeleton has to um, bear the, the brunt of that excess weight and, and you know, will potentially struggle to stay strong in the context of a fall with the overweight setting. Now, there are other you know, concerns about being overweight, but in terms of bone health, that's the concern there. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam and Dr. Ward. That was just really comprehensive and so incredibly helpful. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and transition into our Q&A portion. I know that Adam has started us off with some really wonderful questions. Um, I want to remind everyone, there's also that chat function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send in questions that you have either for Adam or for Dr. Ward. We've already got a couple in. So um, if that's all right with my lovely speakers here, we'll go ahead and start diving into those. And the first one is a really great question. Should a person still have x-rays post-spinal fusion? Dr. Ward, maybe you could start us off with that one. Oh, that is a really great question. So post-spinal fusion, the, the integrity of the spine is, is facilitated, and it can even be challenging to see fractures post-spinal fusion. Uh, I would anticipate that your orthopedic surgeon might be doing x-rays in any case to monitor how that's going. So I think a, a periodic spine x-ray is uh, still valuable for, for both reasons, but certainly less uh, informative than pre-scoliosis surgery. Do you find that just the, the, the visualization of the metal kind of obscures what you're really able to see? It, it does. I mean, you still can see uh, elements of the vertebral body, um, but, you know, I don't tend to see problems once there is the hardware in place. So I think as long as your uh, orthopedic surgeon is monitoring you periodically and you're feeling well, uh, you know, that, that would typically be sufficient. That's great. The next couple of questions have to do with steroids, which makes quite a bit of sense. We know that steroids certainly af affect bone health significantly. So this next one is in regard to weekend dosing. So have you, do you have any experience with weekend dosing steroids and the effect of weekend dosing on bone health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question, and people have wrestled with that. Uh, certainly, in, in Canada, we tend to use daily dosing, so I don't have direct experience myself with intermittent or weekend dosing. I'm going to call it intermittent dosing. However, there was a study published out of the UK, the United Kingdom, Birmingham. Nicola Crabtree was the first author on this study. And she looked at boys who were on daily prednisone versus intermittent prednisone. And she showed that fractures of the spine were less after two years on intermittent compared to a daily prednisone. So about 8% after two years on the intermittent prednisone compared to 40% in the boys on daily prednisone. And growth was better on intermittent prednisone as well. She also though looked at muscle function and found that muscle function was a little bit better on the daily prednisone. So we have this very delicate balance, don't we, where we'd you know, sort of love to, in some way, with, you know, minimize the steroid exposure, but remember the steroids are uh, treating the muscle. And I always uh, say that it's the first principle is always to treat the underlying disease optimally, and then for the complications, monitor those carefully and inter intervene uh, in a timely fashion. But that's a Most great def question. Most definitely. That was, I, I didn't realize the discrepancy there in, in, those, um, in those numbers. So that's really interesting. And I think that the message that I would share with everybody listening in is that if you are curious about what regimen makes the most sense for yourself or your child, that's certainly a question to have with your endocrinologist and with your neuromuscular specialist as you talk through risks and benefits based on your specific situation, whether it's age, height, weight, all of these different considerations. So it's, it's certainly a complex thing to, to really 
um, try to understand. So in that same vein, um, I, I want to ask you about um, the percentage of the Duchenne population that develops osteoporosis um, in consideration with whether or not they're on steroids or not at all. Have there been any studies done on what those rates of osteoporosis look like based on steroid use? Mm -hmm. So the studies that have, have looked at steroid use um, say there's about a double of the risk of fractures. So there's already a risk of fractures in Duchenne without steroids, and then the risk is about uh, double in terms of uh, long bone fracture. There have been studies that have been shown that in patients in the pediatric years who are on steroids that um, after uh, a number of years, more than five years, that the spine fracture rate is about 50%. So, um, and studies have shown that in the absence of steroids that the long bone fracture rate is about 60% in some series, 30 to 60%. So what does that mean? It means that on steroids, most individuals at some point will have a vertebral fracture. And that's why we recommend this routine monitoring. And then the long bone fractures are really quite variable, right? Because they depend on how you fall and how quickly you might be walking. And they're more common in the ambulatory uh, than the non-ambulatory phase if you're navigating a wheelchair um, fairly well. So long bone fractures are a little bit more unpredictable. But the data really suggests that vertebral fractures on steroids uh, are very likely to occur in most individuals over time. Okay, great. So I think with that in mind, and we talk about the importance of fall prevention, I think that's a nice segue to this next question, which I'm actually going to field to you, Adam. Um, I know that you talked about falls yourself, both as a young kiddo and now as a young man. Um, would you be able to share any tips or tricks with us when it comes to preventing falls um, from the from the chair? Yeah. Um, so my experiences, I guess, um, have both been in circumstances where uh, there's a change in elevation. Um, so the first time was when I was at uh, the park and the swale ended up being too steep. Um, and, uh, but I think there's also, um, it was also on uneven surfaces a little, it was on grass. Um, so I think while you're on uneven surfaces that are, uh, steep as well, um, it might be a good idea to have someone nearby to sort of, uh, spot you, um, and as for uh, my second fall um, with steepness, it was going down a ramp. Um, and basically what we found or what I've found there um, is that when I, I've recently, so like after, after that fall, um, I did sometimes go down uh, steep ramps like that and um, I really made sure to uh, kind of shift the center of gravity of my wheelchair. Um, so I would tilt my chair back. Um, so that would put, I guess, more of the weight towards the back of the chair. So like when you're going down the ramp, you're putting more of the weight um, in the back instead of in the front where it could tip. Um, and then also for that, um, like I, would use spotters as well if there's people um, ar around. Um, so basically just like someone to hold on to the back and maybe the side of the wheelchair um, just to make sure it doesn't uh, tip forward. Those are really great tips. I love the idea of kind of shifting your weight back with how the, the seat of your chair is positioned. That seems really practical. And I think it speaks to the importance of having a chair that fits you um, and that has the features that you need to keep yourself safe when you're out and about in the community. So that's really, really helpful, Adam. Um, so my next couple of questions are in regard to the use of Prolia. And Dr. Ward, I know that we talked a little bit about how Prolia isn't used as commonly in, in standard endocrinology care. And that's something that we oftentimes might see more in an adult population. Um, but I, I am curious what you can share with us regarding efficacy, the need for labs and monitoring and um, any potential electrolyte imbalance. Could you maybe speak to that a bit for us? 
Yeah, so I anticipated that question. So I did put together a little slide, um, if you can still see that, that just talks about what Prolia is. Prolia is denosumab, which is an antibody to a molecule called rank ligand. And rank ligand normally revs up those osteoclasts. So remember I talked about the fact that the osteoclasts uh, chew up bone. And so when you shut down rank ligand with an antibody, in this case, denosumab, then this is another mechanism to de decrease the extent to which the bone is being chewed up or resorbed. So denosumab is actually in the same category as intravenous bisphosphonate therapy. It is also an anti-resorptive. It has been approved uh, in adults with postmenopausal osteoporosis, so uh, adult women, uh, in steroid-induced osteoporosis, and in male osteoporosis, all in adults. So it is something that is used routinely in adults, and I would not be surprised if there were uh, men who ha are on, have Duchenne or are on denosumab. It is a very potent um, anti-resorptive agent. The thing to understand about denosumab, which in adults is given every six months subcutaneously, so not intravenously, is that you can't miss a dose. This is an antibody that wears off, whereas intravenous bisphosphonates are very long acting. So if your dose is a little bit delayed because of COVID or for other reasons, it's not a big deal. But in, with denosumab, you really have to stick to your six month uh, subcutaneous injections if you're receiving them as an adult. If you delay the dose, then those osteoclasts can rev up again and they can uh, chew up bone and release calcium into the bloodstream and cause high calcium in the blood, which is um, you know, something that makes you feel quite unwell. So important just to understand that denosumab needs to um, be given without any delays in the schedule. If you are experiencing delays because of COVID or anything else, you may want to consider transitioning to um, zoledronic acid or pomidronate, or if you're an adult, even an oral bisphosphonate. We don't use the oral bisphosphonates in children, but in adults, that is a reasonable temporizing measure. So we do recommend periodic sampling of um, mineral ions like calcium, especially when you first go on denosumab. But if you've been on denosumab for a while and you're having troubles getting to a lab because of COVID, but you've been stable and you've been on it for at least a year, if you were to miss one of those labs and you were nevertheless keeping your schedule, then I wouldn't be particularly concerned. That's some really helpful background and I think it um, segues nicely to my next question for you, Dr. Ward, about some of these medications. I think you gave a really nice um, overview of the pomidronate versus the zolendronate. And I would have to imagine some of the families were like myself, like, oh, I need to screenshot this slide. It's just such a helpful visual pathway that you laid out. Um, I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about um, some of the benefits and, and how families would go about making the choice of which infused drug is best for, for their child. Um, I know the pomidronate's more frequent. It's longer acting, it's gentler, whereas the zolendronate is less often and quicker, but maybe a bit harsher with the side effects. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about just considerations as, as families think through the uh, decision-making matrix between these two commonly used medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of considerations, including what might be available to you at your center. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we started to use zoledronate, not, not everybody had access to it. I think increasingly, especially if you're at a specialized center, um, individuals will have both available. Now, I must say that in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I use zoledronic acid virtually exclusively. And I reserve pomidronate for the children who I consider medically fragile. So children with cancer who have bone problems who are really in the throes of being unwell with their chemotherapy or children who are medically fragile for other reasons where you really want to you know, um, try to ensure that those first infusion side effects are as gentle as possible. Now that said, pomidronate also has first infusion side effects just a little bit less in the way of the tummy upset. So in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the boys are they're, they're quite robust and they do very, very well with the zoledronic acid. 
we make sure that they have a, a, a strong anti-nausea agent and that just shuts down the nausea and vomiting without any difficulty. Uh, we make sure they have something for the fever and the aches. And then we have a low threshold for giving the extra steroid to help them with that first infusion. And you know, having said that, about 25% don't have any side effects at all. So you know, we, we do go to great lengths to minimize side effects with the first dose or with subsequent doses, although usually not as dramatic. Uh, but some of them come back and say, you know, what was, what was all the fuss about Dr. Ward? I, I actually didn't have any side effects. So, you know, I think really in the Duchenne population, the zoledronic acid is very reasonable. I think that, you know, typically you might have quite a few appointments and a lot to juggle. And so a one hour infusion that you can give every six months instead of a four hour infusion every four months, I, I really think is, is the way to go. And I think that your, if your clinician is comfortable and is given it and knows how to manage those side effects, then it, it really um, you know, is, is a very reasonable choice. But if you didn't have zoledronic acid and you had pimidronate, it's very good agent in terms of benefit. Um, the, you know, it's, it's not about which drug is better for the skeleton. In my mind, it's about which is more convenient and which suits you best. Just like you were talking, Rachel, about which steroid prescription suits you best. You know, these are very um, personal decisions that you make with your care provider, uh, understanding all the dimensions. Wonderful, Dr. Ward. I think that that's really helpful context as we think through these decisions as family have, fam families have to approach what makes the most sense for them and for their child. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that we are just a little bit past the top of the hour. I'm going to end with one more question and then we'll go ahead and close things up. Um, and that question is um, for you again, Dr. Ward, are you aware of any active studies on using some of these therapies that we've talked about in a prophylactic? manner as opposed to once we've started to see um, osteoporotic changes in the bone? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, I'm glad you raised it because we, we really see that we need to be heading towards fracture prevention, right? Prevention of the very first fracture. And so understand that, you know, years ago, the bisphosphonates were started once there was back pain and, you know, you didn't even do an x-ray until there was back pain. And typically people would wait for a few fractures until you started therapy. And we've now backed it up to starting treatment at the first sign of a vertebral fracture, even if it's not causing any pain and a single uh, long bone fracture. So we've moved things up substantially in the 2018 care guidelines. The next step is preventing first ever fractures. And it's, it's on our minds. Um, I, I am aware of efforts in Australia uh, to, to use zoledronic acid in a more preventative fashion in the research context. I'm not exactly sure where that is at from a study perspective, but I can tell you we're headed in that direction. And, and let me just explain something to you in that light. So if I have a, a boy that I'm looking at in clinic and I'm doing a spine x-ray, and sometimes those early signs are very subtle, I will not wait till I'm absolutely sure there's a vertebral fracture. If it's subtle and I think there might be, I err on the side of there's probably a vertebral fracture. So you see my orientation is to starting as early as possible. In terms of prevention of the first fracture, I do think we need in specialized centers to gather information about what that's like because it is a heavy protocol, the zoledronic acid, it's intravenous, there are some side effects. So, you know, we want to make sure that we started at the right time so that we don't overburden families unnecessarily. So I think we need a, a little bit more time to sort that out, but it's a great question because it's certainly very much on our minds as clinicians, and I, I'm grateful for the question. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think that that'll about do it for our questions today. So I want to extend just the biggest, warmest thank you to both Adam and Dr. Ward for joining us today. It was just really, really wonderful to just dive a little bit deeper into this really important topic. Um, it's certainly one that's important and helpful throughout the Duchenne lifespan. So thank you so much for this really great conversation. Um, I want to remind everyone that's listening in, this will be available archived on our website if you would like to go 
back and rewatch it or share it with any other um, Duchenne parents or colleagues who might be interested in this content that we've produced for you today. And we also have um, two more installments of this Endocrinology Connect with the Experts series. Next week, we'll dive into puberty, same time, same place. Um, and the following week, we'll talk a little bit about growth. So please feel free to join us, submit those questions in advance or live during the live stream. And with that, we'll go ahead and conclude. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Adam.